Good morning, everyone in the room and everyone online. Uh, this meeting will be recorded. I'm Hannah Jardine. I'm one of the teaching and learning specialists here with CTRL. I'm joined by my colleague. I'm Sahil Mathur. I'm a graduate assistant for teaching and learning at CTRL. And we also are both adjunct instructors on campus. So I teach in the School of Education. I teach at SIS. So a lot of the ideas that we're bringing here to you today are from our own teaching experiences, as well as um, tons of resources out there about how to have a great first day of class. So the first day of class setting the stage for um, students to thrive. So we have a few guidelines since we are in a hybrid presentation this morning. Um, so throughout this workshop, we ask that you make yourself comfortable. So if you're in the room, kind of making yourself comfortable in whatever way is needed. If you're at home, feel free to stim, fidget, stretch your legs as mm -hmm. needed, um, being present. So we do have a few moments where we will ask you to participate or talk with the people around you. So participate in activities in a way that works for you. Um, to speak, if you're in person, please raise your hand. And online, you can use the raise hand function under reactions in Zoom. Um, please share your name before speaking so that um, the different audiences know who is talking. And then if on Zoom, you can also ask questions and share ideas in the chat. So I do have the chat open in front of me. And be generous with your knowledge and respectful of others' knowledge. So we will be sharing a ton of ideas with you this morning, but also making space for you to share ideas with each other from your own practice. This is not working for me. All right. Um, so our workshop outcomes this morning, we're aiming to um, help you identify ways to build community in the classroom. So things like collaborative norm setting and introdu introduction exercises, considering the perspective of students taking a new class, um, implement an active two-way review of the syllabus, and developing a plan for the first day of class to lay the foundations for equity and access throughout the semester. So we're going to start with a word cloud to kind of set a foundation of what are our goals here for today. So we're going to use Mentimeter. So for those of you in the room, if you have a cell phone or a laptop, you'll be able to access this. And for those at home, same thing. Um, on the next slide, we'll show a QR code and or give you a code so you can choose how you want to engage with the Mentimeter. Uh, the question we're asking is, how do you want students to feel on the first day of class? So the responses will display as a word cloud. So you'll limit your responses to singular words, but you should be able to respond, I think as many times as you'd like, should give you at least three. All right, so here is that question, the QR code. And then um, if you want to go to menti.com and use that code, you'll be able to access it there as well. All right, I see some responses starting to show up. We want students to feel excited, welcome, curious. Um, and in the word cloud, the words that are coming up more often will show up larger. So it looks like a few people have entered excited, prepared, relaxed, calm, engaged, comfortable, challenged, supported, included. Any comments on what you're seeing here, either from online or in person? Not threatened. I see a lot of like, affective words, right? He's not threatened, relaxed, calm. It's not typically what we think about with the first day of class, but I'm glad to see these words there. Um, any other comments or? as you're reflecting on what you and your peers are saying or typing. What's that, Hill, anything, anything you wanna point out? Anything surprising to you? No, I, I think that these are already great and I this is a good sort of starting point for us to think about how we can get students to this place in the first year of class. Uh, yeah. Yeah, excellent. And this next um, opportunity will help you to think through some of these things as well. So 
Uh, we'll now model a focused listing. And I should have mentioned this before, uh, part of the teaching and learning team's kind of approach to our workshops is we will model a lot of things that you might do with your students on the first day of class. So feel free to steal our idea and use a Mentimeter and create a word cloud with your students about, you know, how are you feeling on this first day of class? Or um, what are some words that you might think of when you think of the topic of my course? Um, so in this focus listing, we want to also get you to think about the responses to the following questions. So those of you online can put this in the chat. Those of you in person, feel free to either reflect to yourself or talk to the person next to you. What do you think needs to be covered in the first session of a course? So what are you trying to get done on that first day? I'll give you a few minutes here. So for those of us in the room, if we could start to wrap up our conversations, I know you're just getting started, but there will be other opportunities to talk. All right, let's, let's come back together. I know um, I apologize for cutting off these great conversations. We haven't even given you any content to think about yet, have we? Um, so another reason just to kind of give you the, the meta of why we do some of these activities and how you might use them in your course, um, this idea of a focus listing, sometimes you can even turn it into a game where you pair students off and say, who can list as many ideas about X as possible and see who can come up with the most. Um, so here we wanted to get you to think about what do you think needs to be covered in the first day of class so that when we do present the information that we have, you can kind of map that onto your ideas that you already have and see if we're giving you anything new or we're giving you something that you can build off of that you're already doing. Um, so this is a great way to kind of build your students' confidence and give them a foundation to connect new material onto what they already know and connect to that prior knowledge. Got a lot of um, answers in the chat as well, so I'll read a few of them out loud to those who are in the room. A lot of people mentioning expectations, um, introducing the culture of the course, the syllabus, the course policies, um, some content, getting to know each other, meeting each other, um, and giving a broad overview of the course topic so students understand what they're getting into for the rest of the semester. So we will get into more 
details and ideas about all of these different things and um, talk to you about how to make them potentially even more interactive. Uh, so on our agenda, so the different parts of the first day that we will talk more about today are student introductions, uh, an active syllabus review. So what does it look like to review the syllabus with your students, not just for your students? Uh, engaging with course content, is there time for it? If so, how might we do that on the first day? Community norm building, and then at the end of the workshop, we have um, a guided worksheet to help you develop your first day plan. If you'd like to follow along with the slides, you can access them at this link and or this QR code, and we will also be sharing them after the session as well, that some people you know, like to follow along as we're going. All right, I think. I'll give it another minute on here in case you're still pulling up your phone or needing that link. All right, so this quote, social belonging is associated with higher achievement, particularly for students from marginalized groups. A lot of people in the chat, as well as in your conversations here, talking about wanting students to feel comfortable, to feel connected, um, to feel like a sense of community, right, as they come into the first day. So there's lots and lots of research behind why that's important, um, which is why we wanted to kind of start the session with this quote. So the first thing we'll talk to you about that you might want to do on the first day are student introductions. Right? And there are a ton of ways to do that with your students, um, asking students to share their names with the class. So um, we suggest having options to specify what students go by, if it's different from their legal name, um, sharing their pronouns and pronunciation of their name if they're comfortable. Something we were going to do with you all today, but we decided not to since we don't have desks in this room, is have you all create name tents. And this is something I do with my students on the first day. It's kind of a, a very um, comfortable way to settle into the class. So they come into the class. I'll show you what. What I prepare. So just a piece of paper folded to make uh, a little tent and then give them markers or they might just use their own writing utensils and they can put their name on there, um, their pronouns if they'd like, and then drawing anything that represents them. Um, it gives them a chance to kind of get settled in, to get creative if that's um, something that makes them feel more comfortable and also can kind of talk to the people around them about what they're adding to their name tent. Then that also helps me to get to know them much quicker in the semester. Um, I'll collect those name tents at the end of class and use them for the first few weeks of class to, as I get to know the students. So this is a picture of one that I created for one of my classes. Um, encouraging students to reflect on their goals and motivations by asking what motivated you to take this class or what are you hoping to learn from this course? That could be something they talk in small groups about. Um, depending on the size of your class, you could have everyone share. That could also be something they fill out on a Canvas discussion board before or after the first day of class so that it's not all necessarily happening in class. Um, and then modeling introductions by using this format to introduce yourself, which is, I put the picture here. So they'll see that coming in, uh, my name 10, and then instructions about creating their own. Um, quickly, if you're teaching online or hybrid. Um, and for those of you who are online right now, um, you could ask students to rename themselves in Zoom or add their pronouns if they'd like. So online participants, you could try this right now if you'd like, rename yourself. Um, I've also seen some people write the pronunciation of their name on Zoom, um, perhaps. So Lucy, I see your comment in the chat, anyone else here teaching remotely? So here's a way to do introductions online. Um, so yeah, if anybody else is teaching remotely, feel free to connect with Lucy in the chat. I'll just comment mm -hmm. once on, the, uh, on Lucy's comment in the chat. So I've been teaching remotely for the last few years uh, in an online program. And there are a couple of ways in which you can have specific things to build community online. One is encourage students to uh, post articles that they think are interesting and important that they would like to share with the rest of the class in a dedicated discussion forum in the learning management system. Um, that helps to build community and many of the practices that we followed. So we can't have name tense online, but in the first class, get students to talk about um, why they're in the class, uh, talk about their or sort of their background in the subject that helps to sort of get their personal motivations for the class and others could 
potentially see something uh, that they res that resonates with them as well. So those are a couple of ways, and there are um, other ways as well. But happy to talk more about this, Lucy. Thanks. And also as, so why we included this quote here, motivation is sourced internally, but teachers can provide the fuel needed to power it, is to encourage you to also introduce yourself, introduce your background, introduce why you are excited to teach the course, um, that students can feel that excitement, feel that enthusiasm about the subject matter. They're interested to know what kind of experiences you're bringing into the class, um, especially I know a few of you in here are adjuncts with a, a wide range of really awesome professional experience that you are doing at the same time as teaching. Um, so students love to hear that. And that's a big reason why students come to AU is because they know the faculty have really great professional experiences that they can learn from and benefit from. So now we've thought about student introductions and sometimes we think of icebreakers as a way to introduce um, get students to introduce themselves, but just very quickly, an individual reflection, and if anybody wants to share out loud or in the chat, feel free. What comes to mind when you hear, let's do an icebreaker? I, I see Liz panic with a smiley face <laughs> and some laughs in the room. So and I saw some faces like kind of eye rolling and a little smirk, right? This I, this word icebreaker can often bring up this sense of, oh, not again, it's the first day of class, do we have to do this? Um, so the first thing, when you put together a list of icebreaker do's and don'ts, and the first thing we put on the do is consider renaming some of these activities that you might consider icebreakers, but um, often say this is a warm up activity or this is a get to know each other activity or this is our introduction activity, um, a community building activity. Any number of those things, those are still icebreakers, but students are saying, okay, we're gonna do a quick get to know each other activity, maybe are less inclined to feel that panic. Um, and other things that will reduce some of that panic and anxiety, giving students a chance to reflect before sharing. So if you're asking them, you know, why did you take this course? might have them write down their ideas or share with the person next to them before you ask a few students to share out loud. Um, asking those broad open-ended questions that are widely applicable and provide a variety of ways to approach the answer. So, um, you know, not questions that are asking for something very personal or very specific. Um, and that breaking students into pairs or small groups. So not necessarily going around, okay, we're gonna hear from all 25 of you. You have to share with everybody this information or the answer to this question, but instead, you know, share with the person next to you, then let's switch around, share with a different person next to you. And they can get to know a few people in the class um, and get to know more people over time. So the don'ts, oh yeah, Susan. I have so many thoughts about it. Okay. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw in too that uh, I, what I think of when somebody says, we're gonna do an icebreaker, is I think they're gonna ask me, a question and I'm going to give an answer like that's what people think icebreakers are now mm. because that's all we do is like if you want to do what would it you know or if you could be super or like if you da, 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 da. and there are many ways to do connector activities besides asking a question and making people answer it mm. so if you don't know of any of those things please come see me and I will yeah my web page that has my favorite icebreakers oh, I still call yeah. them icebreakers because they are known as icebreakers and people Grown when they hear it. I know I do too. Can you give us one or two examples of things that are different, but people like? Yeah, so what I did in the first day of class last semester was uh, some of the things on the don't list. <laughs> um, one called Mixer Mix Up. Thank so you. I don't know if folks online can hear this, where uh, you think of a thing about yourself that is short, that you don't mind everybody in the class knowing. It could be anything, that you like muffins, that you're from Philadelphia, whatever. But it's not visible and you go up to somebody and say, I'm Susan, I'm from Philadelphia, I'm from Baltimore, actually, I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> and they say, um, just give me something. Um, I'm, I'm, tell me something about yourself. Uh, I'm from India. And what's your name? Sahil. So then I become Sahil and I'm from India and Sahil becomes Susan from Baltimore. And then we go and introduce ourselves to somebody else as the new person. And then we switch, it's called mix or mix up. You switch identities again go around the room for a few minutes until I, the facilitator calls stop. And then we go around the room, everybody introduces whoever they are at that moment, 
I'm Saho from India. Or I can't remember the name of the person, but they're from India. And then Saho always raises his hand, goes, I'm Saho, I'm from India. And somebody else goes, I'm from India too. And so it's a really great way for people to get to know each other. You laugh, it's like very interactive and you're moving around the room. So it's the same format. I'm asking a question, you're getting an answer, but it's very physical. It's, you meet a lot more people, you're moving. People have to like pay attention to the rules because they don't want to mess up. Um, so it forces them to be present. Anyway, so that's one example of like just a, a variation on that theme. Mm. Um, but don't just think you have to sit in a chair and answer a question. Mm. Could the online people hear what Susan was sharing? It seemed like my mic was picking it up. But... Yes. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> this is this, the MacBook Pro is a very strong mic. Um, yeah. So thank you for sharing, Susan. I think that example really lines up to with some of our don'ts. Like not forcing students to share deeply personal information. So what I love about that is just share something about yourself. It's super open-ended. You can choose something that's, you know, somebody could go personal if they want to, but, or you could do something very broad. Um, ask very specific questions. Don't ask very specific questions. Don't require students to memorize and restate information about their peers. So that's that example where, you know, let, let's go around the room and the 10th person in line has to repeat the 10 things that were said before them. That could be very anxiety inducing. Although the, the intent is, is great that you're getting to know your peers, but avoiding those things that are anxiety inducing or feel like quizzing um, or putting students on the spot or cold calling. So making a space where students are excited to share versus forced to share, I guess. Um, and Karen is asking, where does she have those icebreakers? So I'll get the link from you and then Nonprofit comfort. Nonprofit comfort. Oh, sorry. Saha will type it in the chat. So we're going to share that link in the chat and then I'll also share it in the follow up email. Okay. All right. So I'm going to switch it over to you. Thank you. Um, so one of the many things that pe that folks discuss that uh, we typically do on the first day of class is cover the syllabus, right? Talk about um, what we're going to do in the course and the different components of the syllabus. So um, could I ask you all to share either in conversation with the person sitting next to you or in the chat if you're online, what in your view is the purpose of going over the syllabus on the first day of class? Why do you think we do this? Uh, Oh, that's Okay, so folks, let's come back. There are some great conversations going on over here that I can see, and sorry for interrupting. 
but um, I'm going to share a couple of great responses in the chat. So many people have talked about um, making sure that students understand the course expectations, the format, the syllabus and all of that, um, map out the course content for the, for the semester. Um, one comment I really like from Karin is get them excited about the subject, right? So that's one of the things that we wanted students to do or wanted to do with students on the first day of class and the syllabus might be a way to do that. Um, students can understand important grading policies. It gives students, this is an important point as well that Lucy makes. Um, going through the syllabus gives students the opportunity to figure out whether they want to be in the class or not because there's still time to change in the first couple of weeks, right? Um, do any of you want to share what you discussed in terms of what, why we do syllabus review? Go ahead. Just so about our own anxiety that might prevent us from focusing, like, how am I going to get graded, mm -hmm. or as a second or student, mm -hmm. um, or it's going to be too much work, or right. I have to have a lot of exams. So, kind of getting that out of the way so mm -hmm. that students can focus on what you're going to be doing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, there's the anxiety about what the course is going to entail. And sometimes having that clarified can address that anxiety. Um, yeah, so making those clear at the beginning. There was another hand up here. Yeah, I was going to say just managing expectations in the sense mm -hmm. that one, you want to manage expectations about what is considered success and per good performance mm -hmm. um, because yeah. it's going to vary. And two, like if happiness is sort of that delta between like expectations and reality, we want them to match up closely so if their reality matches their expectations then they're going to be happy with the course even if they do poorly in the course because mm -hmm. they expected it to be tough mm -hmm. or whatever right yeah and so we want to like manage gen z mm -hmm. to general yeah. expectations yeah for happiness yeah i really like that two-way process right so it's the instructor managing what expectations are required of the course but also the students sort of setting a bar for themselves in some ways and managing what they expect from the course thanks for sharing that just to make a comment. This is my first time um, writing syllabus, and, mm -hmm. and I used some examples from my friends that were very helpful with that. Um, but I also, in my day job, I have a lot of experience with policy, and it seems to me like a lot of the syllabus responding today yeah. have, have become a policy document. Right. And yeah. The, the one that I, you know, am submitting this semester is and plus pages yeah. because most of it is you know my bio you know the description of the class the uh -huh. schedule of the class and the assignments and then there's you know six yeah. pages of policy that can really be found in the student handbook can be found elsewhere and it's just a cutting paste of the yeah why, yeah you know why am i going to do that right yeah. why am, and i and i we were just discussing like do yeah. we really need to go through our entire syllabus yeah and discuss all of the points in right there? and i think for me, at least, the answer yeah. is no. You are, if you're interested in the policy on the university privacy policy. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Th then that that please, those please link to that. And right. You guys can find it in your hands. Yeah. Give it to yeah. You. yeah. That's a great right. point. Um, were the folks in the online room able to hear the comment from George? Yes. Okay. No. Okay. So what George was saying was that sometimes syllabi today can come across as a whole bunch of different university policies just listed there. Um, it can be tedious to go through all of those policies during the first year of class. Instead, one way might just be to refer students to those policies and raise any questions. But this gets to the question of if we, or if we, if we want to achieve all these different aspects of um, reviewing the syllabus, how do we go about that? And how do we sort of ensure that it's done in a responsive way? And it's not just one way that the syllabus is telling, sorry, that the instructor is telling the students everything that needs to, that the course entails, right? Um, so just to recap the purposes that we've already discussed, um, some, of the, some of the reasons we go over the syllabus is to establish goals of the course, which could be to the learning outcomes or objectives, clarify the arc and flow of the semester overall so that the students um, get a sense of what to expect throughout. Um, go over course evaluation, which helps with addressing anxiety, but also clarifies expectations, um, course policies and expectations as, as we've been talking about. Um, going through this in the first day also importantly serves as, as an opportunity for students to provide feedback on anything that they'd like. Um, and we'll talk about how to do that in, in sort of the active syllabus review exercise that we have planned. Um, but a couple of other points that I want to highlight is while writing the syllabus, um, 
try and think about it from the student's perspective. And one question that might come to a student's mind when they read something is why are we doing this? Why this assignment or why this policy, right? So one way to, to make it clearer to the students is ensure that there's transparency in all of those policies. So for every policy or uh, decision or assignment format that you have, try and include a sentence or a clause that talks about why we're doing this, right? Um, most questions could, from students could potentially be answered by addressing that uh, in advance in the syllabus as well. Keep the syllabus flexible, allow space for student input. It um, contributes to community building, but also gives them some sense of ownership over what they're gonna do in this course. Um, and when there are specific things about the syllabus, uh, try and address aspects of what we call the hidden curriculum, where um, things that you might think are obvious to students are sometimes not. For example, what are office hours? What are the purpose of office hours? What students should expect to be discussing or not? Um, clarifying all of those for everyone helps address the, those who uh, are probably experience, are perhaps experiencing this for the first time, right? Um, okay, just checking the, the chat for comments. So this is a, a quote from one of our student partners that I think resonates with some of the comments that were made earlier. Um, when the syllabus isn't responsive, you're treating students as bodies in a classroom rather than as individuals. Allowing students to comment on the syllabus teaches self-advocacy, right? So think of the syllabus not as a contract, as sometimes people try and uh, think about it, but rather as a space to start a conversation about the course, right? In line with the, the first impressions that students have, um, sometimes syllabi can... Some, if you're sharing the syllabus beforehand, it can even be before the first year of class. So students read the syllabus and they create the first impression of the course and the instructor and the class overall from just reading the syllabus, right? So for those reasons, it's important to sort of have a responsive attitude, use a warm, positive tone in the syllabus. Um, those can help create a welcoming space, which could then be discussed further on the first day. And you might think of uh, some sort of activity that, uh, uses some innovative way to, to, to go through the syllabus rather than it being just the instructor going through it in sort of a rote manner. Um, so one thing that we've, we've, we've tried to think about and, and suggest is this active two-way syllabus review approach, um, where rather than just presenting the syllabus, you facilitate it with the students, perhaps through breakout rooms. So one thing we suggest is break students into pairs or small groups. Um, give them some time to read through the syllabus uh, themselves. If they've read it in advance, give them some time to focus their thoughts on what they'd like to uh, comment on. Um, some guiding questions for this sort of exercise. What are you most looking forward to in the course? What are you most concerned about? What questions do they have generally about the course? Um, what are you interested in learning beyond what is listed in the requirements in the syllabus? And importantly, uh, to get their sense of what they'd like in the course, what aspects should we adjust, revise, or co-create together? Um, so doing this helps students um, engage in a way that makes them feel included. And also it exposes, as, as the instructor, it exposes your own vulnerability to some extent in a good way. You're, you're showing that the syllabus is not perfect, but um, it, there's room for improvement and you'd like the students to be a part of that process of improvement. Um, and, and additionally, it, it also, so you don't have to do everything that they suggest, right? They might have some suggestions that may not be workable, but just giving them the opportunity to offer points and thoughts and comments um, makes this a less tedious one-way process, right? Um, I guess to add on to that, yeah. um... On the first day, they also might not be ready to answer some of these questions, but just introducing. So you could on the first day, just for example, point them to the course calendar and say, look, at the end of the semester, I have a few TBD weeks, um, because as we go through the course, we're going to think about what's missing. What do we want to expand upon? Um, what new things have we learned? What what has happened in the world that is going to change the course of our content? Um, so keep in mind that we're going to co-create those lessons together at the end of the semester. So it doesn't have to be that you know, you're working on the syllabus all in the first day, but introducing that well, yeah. the transparency and also the flexibility. Yeah. And really set that tone that this is this is as much their learning experience as it is. Uh, 
your teaching materials. Yeah, and I did this kind of by accident. I'll speak up for the folks online. You might include like a panel or a guest speaker mm -hmm. or a you know student co-created so that instead of like TBD, it's mm -hmm. like, no, you know there's gonna be flex. You know there's gonna be a current event that comes up. You know there's gonna be something you don't have the expertise, but your friend does, and then you can bring them in. So just plan for that later and you figure out where to put that and then you can shuffle it in the syllabus. Yeah. No, that's a great suggestion. And uh, something that I did with, I do regularly in my courses, I teach courses on international politics, which are often um, current events relate to those events, to what we learn in the course. So I build in time into my own lesson plans for discussing current events. Uh, so I might share a couple of articles with students beforehand as being optional, not on the syllabus, but it gives them the opportunity to learn about those current events, talk about them in relation to, to the topic. Um, sometimes I ask them to find articles that they think is something they read in the news that is relevant to the course um, and then bring that and share that with the rest of the students. So there are those are some ways in which we can incorporate that sort of flexibility into the syllabus as well. Um, so there are a couple of ways in which you could go about the debrief aspect of this. So ask student groups to present the information and ask questions that they've discussed. Alternatively, you could also use sort of a poll or survey um, to get a pulse of what the students think. Um, one benefit of, of polls or surveys is that they, they can be anonymized. Uh, so it helps students give, give them more free space to uh, share their thoughts. Um, any other thoughts on syllabus review? Yeah, I was wondering if uh, something comes up uh, that students would like to amend or change, which is non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How do you prevent not creating like, mm -hmm. yeah. like a kind of a conflict with their students? Right. You yeah. know? Because, for example, cell phone use. I know mm -hmm. one of my students who has used their cell phone in class. Yeah. We have to talk to each other. Yeah. And I see that. Yeah, I always have to remind them because yeah. they just can they just can't yeah. do that phone. Yeah. And so I have a specific section in my civil work detail where I explain that they're not supposed to use their phone if they have an emergency, they can't go out mm -hmm. and if they mm -hmm. can use their phone, they may be asked to leave. Yeah. And I can that could be an example of something that students find mm, yeah. that they might come to. Right. Now, that's a great point. And just to repeat for the folks online, the question is, if there's a conflict between something that the students suggest um, and you don't, that it's non-negotiable for you as the instructor, how do you address that? For example, cell phone use within the classroom, if the instructor does not want that um, and the students have objections to, to that and um, how do we handle that? So I think a couple of ways. One is if we just... Uh, Sorry, I'm not, I'm not going to go back to the slide, but the idea of why. So if you have a policy for no cell phone use, if you explain why that is and how that helps students learn in the classroom, that might help address it to some extent, at least. Um, another way is, is so when you have these sort of disclaimers in the syllabus that um, use a warm tone to specify the lack of cell phone use. So don't, don't say, uh, ideally, you would not say things like, if you use your cell phone, you will be banned from the class or whatever. I really like your framing that if you need to use it, you can step outside, use it and come back. I think that suggests a warm way of conveying the policy that you have. Um, so does that address your question? Yeah. Okay. And I think also to, I almost am looking and we might reword this last question of what aspects should we adjust makes it seem like anything's open for discussion, right? But what I often do actually in my class is say, well, we're going to co-create some of the later lessons together versus like the policies are set, but, or policies are set, but we're going to create classroom norms together, which is what we'll talk about next. Um, so kind of showing that not everything is up for discussion, but there are different things that you're going to co-create together and different things that you as the instructor made decisions about as the expert and the leader in the room. Yes. And another thing is tying, if, if you're able to tie the policy to the course learning outcomes, that's always a great way to, to justify it. So this is, I was doing this yesterday, developing the AI policy for my own course this coming fall. Um, so in the AI policy, I talk about how um, the policy that we've adopted helps achieve the students' learning outcomes better, right? So tying policies to the overall course learning, out, course learning outcomes is another way to navigate that specific aspect. Go ahead, Rebecca. I'll just point out another- Sorry. 
sorry, cell phone yeah. thing. A lot of schools are banning cell phones in K through 12, not yeah. universities, and some uh, classes are online, and this is like impossible yeah. to police. But I think all, you know, not just being like understanding or even strict or whatever about our desire for cell phone and screen use during class, which I should have made much clearer at the outset of my yeah. class instead of in the middle of my class when it was too late to change. And I even said, oh, I guess. I can't require you not to use your computers. And the kids were like, yes, you can. You could have totally done that. A lot of our mm -hmm. teachers do. And I was like, what? Uh, because it was too hard to get them to change it in the middle. But I also, I, as far as the why, like, hey, not using your cell phone during this class is to help you break your addiction from to your cell phone. And we're all addicted, adults included. So this is a practice space where you are not looking at your phone for 60 minutes in a row uh -huh. or whatever it is and if it's an emergency and you have to step out and you have to make a call to your dying parent sure but like make that like i don't want people to be looking at their phone when they're uh -huh. bored that yeah. is a that is an addictive yeah. tendency yeah. and i want to break that and help them realize right. that addiction right so right. i think we should go even stronger on cell phone and screen use than we do uh -huh. um from my own experience but also Jonathan hates book anxious generation and everything else. These kids don't even know the problems that they have. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we, it's up to us to point it out to them. So right. screen over. Yeah. Yeah. For context, Susan teaches strategies and stress management. So I think <laughs> yes. like putting away your cell phones is modeling. You can yeah. totally connect it to your content. We're managing your stress by putting away the stressor. Yeah. I have, I have two questions. First of all, right. if you didn't put in your syllabus, yeah. no cell phones allowed, can you still make that a policy or does it have to be in writing? Hmm. So in other words, let's say you see it happening, say, hey, this class, no cell phones. Mm -hmm. In other words, you want to make sure it's in the syllabus to you have something to yeah. back yourself up? That's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah you are. That's good. Megan, um, my philosophy on that has always been I can update a schedule yeah. to accommodate changes so I can, I can update assignments. I can update other things too okay. as I go through the class. So I have made big changes about how we're going to do something and just like talked about it with the class and yeah. explained like you know this thing isn't working we're going to change directions a little and this is going to be what we do from now on mm -hmm. and i haven't ever like i haven't ever said no phones in the middle so i haven't done anything about either but um i haven't really gotten much pushback at all like, yeah. yeah so the other question i have is because all the readings practically now are online right yeah i mean nobody has articles and not too many people have articles and books in front of them. So a lot of times the notes are not like what I'm doing out of that paper, right? Yeah. They're also online. So I worry about having your laptop open because they could be doing other stuff, but how do you say no laptops when that's where the readings yeah. and the notes might be? Right. That is that is tricky. The way I've navigated is I allow use of laptops, but I specify what the use of laptop will be. And I have some uh, language about how if they, if, if they need to use it for other things, they should either step out or um, sometimes we have activities that require electronic device use. So I think there's a differentiation between phones and bigger screens that might have Google Docs and stuff like that. No, just so, ask yeah. are most people in class sitting with, everybody has a laptop yeah. in front of them, yeah. right? So we have uh, digital a lot of students opt to get a digital textbook instead of a paper right. because it's much cheaper. Okay. So, so they have to have a laptop. I walk around because sometimes students do homework while doing class. So I walk around and and they know that I if I see that they are not doing what we're doing, I'll um, send something out to them. There's another really important comment in the chat that sometimes uh, students with accommodations require laptops. And if you have a no laptop policy, but someone is using a laptop, it sort of outs them and reveals them as having accommodations. So having um, a laptop allowed policy, but specific reasons for using the laptop um, is a better way to address the accommodations mm -hmm. aspect as well. Um, I do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, to answer your first question, having it written makes it clearer to the students. It leaves less room for uh, uncertainty. And yeah, so just be clear in what it can be, it can and cannot be used for. Uh, can I have a, in the header of my syllabus, I have the syllabus is subject to change, last updated August 20th, 2024. 
Yeah. Um, so though, and I keep mine as a Google Doc, so it's really flexible. But yeah. you could also just have new Word documents that you save with that little notation. Um, yeah, and something on that point. Sometimes that wording of the syllabus is subject to change can be scary. It, it, it's like the instructor can change it at any point. Subject to change with notice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So or so make sure that that comes across in a warm tone as well. So we're a, a long way into this workshop, but we haven't yet talked about the actual course content, right? We've been talking about policies and syllabi and how to sort of set up the classroom. Um, some of the reasons why students are excited about the course is because they want to learn the subject, right? Mm -hmm. That's why they, they taught the course. Okay. So um, think about when we introduce the course overall and the course content more specifically, how do we get students curious and excited about the topic itself? So a couple of ways to do that is, like we modeled at the beginning, ask, um, this is a word cloud that was made from Hannah's class. And the, and the question was, what words would you describe um, as, as depicting your ultimate, your ideal teaching persona? And this was a course on education. So something like that, ask students to describe words that they would, would use to uh, describe the topic or their interest in the topic using a word cloud. Um, and more generally, asking broad, thought-provoking questions to assess what students learn, ex expect to learn in the course, where students are in terms of their prior knowledge. Um, ask them to, to think about how what they learn will connect to their personal lives or other motivations. Um, have them discuss what they think about the topic coming in and share experiences um, with the rest of the class as well. Uh, that so. And this also helps the class sort of orient the whole class as to where different students are and how they might be able to contribute throughout the course. Um, and ways to, to sort of do this initial thought-provoking uh, exercise include collaborative digital tools like Mentimeter, like we modeled. Um, and they can share ideas with you and with each other in an anonymous format. Um, any thoughts? What are ways in which we can get students excited about the course topic itself? Go ahead. Um, I always share why I'm passionate about uh -huh. it. And bring yeah. down a little bit of like I am human as well in this situation. Yeah. And it um tends to open the door to them being more interested in share. And then I teach environmental stuff and sustainability. So there usually is some passion behind it mm -hmm. or some personal experience that led to them wanting to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um so creating that space in that first day or first couple of days for me to share why I do this work and mm -hmm. why it's important to me personally um, and giving them giving them the opportunity to share that as well has always been a nice, like, this is why we're here. And yeah. The end goal is to improve these things that we care so much about. Yeah, so there's that shared sense of motivation. It's both the student's motivation as well as the instructor's passion for the subject that comes through through that. Another I'm question. Now, Sorry. After presenting this, the introductions and icebreakers, the syllabus review, introducing course content could all intertwined yeah there's certain activities that kind of cover all three goals yeah at the same time yeah that's, that's like the question why do you want to be in this course yes yeah. Yeah. yeah the motivation is why? is yeah that aligns with the content as well so one question that i have for all of you is introducing the course broadly is fine but students are sometimes um they they, they have the ambivalent about reading or preparing for for week one so this is a question for all of you should we assign reading for or teach substantive content on day one of the course? Go ahead. I do have the assignment to read the syllabus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So reading the syllabus. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a great reading assignment. Read the syllabus as an assignment and a quiz on the syllabus. Yeah. And bring any questions that they have. Okay. Others? Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. My answer is no. I would. Okay. You know, teach. Okay. Heavy content. I think some introduction. Yeah. Some discussion about you know what's going to be covered. And mm -hmm. Maybe hit the high notes. Yeah. But. Yeah. So, so just for the for the people in the online room, uh, the comment from the audience was that. No, ideally we wouldn't. We just have the first day for introductions and policies and getting to know each other and the community building aspect, but not necessarily substantive content. Um, did you want to share? Yeah, uh, uh, unpopular opinion as usual. I think yes, you should teach uh, substantive content on day one, uh, short, 
but that gives them a taste. They might drop the class. They might encourage someone to add the class. They need to get a taste of like the content and your teaching style briefly. Obviously, you don't have a lot of time. Yeah. I don't think you should assign substantive reading mm -hmm. before the class, but introducing a topic and giving them a taste of your teaching style and the content they're going to get, yeah. I think is great. Yeah, those are all, all, all great points, right? So there are some uh, benefits and shortcomings to uh, assigning content on, on day one, some of which we've already discussed. So benefits is it gets students excited about the content, like about the topic overall, <laughs> but the, the getting to read something beforehand might get them excited. It conveys the typical format that you might use because most of the rest of the weeks are going to be dealing with the content. So students get a sense. It also helps with orienting them to whether they like the format or not, so they can decide whether to stay in the course and set expectations for uh, class discussion. But some shortcomings are students may be reluctant to go deep into reading um, without an initial introduction to what we're doing in the course overall. And also they may not have yet had the opportunity to discuss with the instructors how to read a particular article, what is expected to them, how much of, the, of that do they need to bring to the um, to the to the discussion, how much critique they're expected to. So all of those, the, the first day of class is an opportunity to, opportunity to clarify those expectations, which might sort of go against this idea. Um, apologies for that. Uh, okay. It's other considerations for discussion. That's what uh, that's what's written there. But some things to consider are logistical aspects. So if you're teaching on Monday and students got access to the syllabus on Friday, do they have enough time to do the reading? Um, how will the first day's content impact the overall learning in the course? To what extent does that shape um, how they are likely to benefit from the rest of the course? So, and also consider assigning broad topic overviews, which gives them that sense of, okay, we're going to discuss these different things um, and also helps them, helps orient the students to the subject overall. So if you are going to assign substantive content, it might um, help to have broad overview, something related to current affairs possibly, but uh, maybe save deep analysis of specific theories related to that field for week two or week three. Um, any thoughts? Um, there's a point in the chat that there is so much that should be done in the first year of class, there's never enough time. Yeah. Um, and the content is definitely one aspect of that. Um, I think I'm gonna hand it over to Hannah now to talk about Actually, talk for the one more thing you could throw into your first day of class. Um, so I'll just ask you to reflect individually. No need to share out loud, but just think about a time that you felt included in a class, in a meeting, et cetera. Hopefully you feel included in this session today. And what made you feel that way? Can I ask a question? Yeah. You, you mentioned a couple of times about students dropping and adding or dropping classes. Is there feedback? Like if I you know go to a couple of classes and do our thing and students drop in the first week, but is there some feedback as to why they have dropped the classes? Hmm. So, um, like, so for the you know, online I was a complete jerk and I yeah. my my yeah my presentation was you know, yeah. too difficult or yeah. I, is there some yeah for the, the online audience was is there feedback for why they dropped the class? I don't they don't have to submit anything. And I having talked to students, I feel like the number one reason they're dropping a class is just because they got off a wait list somewhere else and they need to move their schedule around. It's usually not related to I see Nabila nodding in the back. Um yeah. not related to you or your class or something. It might be that they really need this other class and now they finally got into it and they move things around or their club is meeting during your class so they picked a different section or something there's a lot of schedule adjustments that happen in the first few weeks so yeah, yeah. so don't assume that it's a thing about it could be yeah sure. i could say that i was a serial class dropper when i was in college i was way overloaded at the beginning yeah essentially go shopping and like so mm. classes i like test and then leave them behind and i was like oh that one's the one that i need again it was never anything personal about Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the um, reason why we had you reflect on this question is because we're going to close out the session today with thinking about how you might build class norms with your students. So this is a question that you might actually ask your students to think about. And when we asked the student partners this question, um, this was what one of them answered, uh, candidness. 
So when thinking about my first impression of the professor, I think what parts of myself am I allowed to bring or allowed to show in this class? Am I allowed to bring the inquisitive part of me? Am I allowed to sit comfortably? What does the professor choose to be receptive to? So I think this also gets at this idea of authenticity and transparency and being a, a human with your students. Um, so thinking about what another thing that you might do on your first day, and I typically end my first day with this. So we've gotten a chance to know each other. We've gotten a chance to review the syllabus. We um, talk a little bit about the content and then we close the first class with, now how do we want to function together for the rest of the semester? What are the norms we wanna set? So it's a little bit different than policies. You might have your specific policies in your syllabus, but this is more like, how do we approach discussions? Um, what are some of the kind of guiding principles we might want to um, communicate with each other? So some steps for collaborative norm setting, if you want to go through an activity like this, you would start with individual reflection. So providing opportunities for students to think or write to their ideas and perspectives. So like I did by introducing that question to you. And on the next slide, we have a few more guiding questions as options. So getting students to think about, you know, what makes you feel included in a class session or setting. Um, then having students talk with a partner or in small groups, sharing their ideas, recognizing common themes like, oh, okay, we all agreed that this needs to happen. Or we all agreed that putting our distractions away is really important to us because I think it's rude when my classmates are all on their cell phones when I'm sharing my ideas. Um, so giving them a chance to kind of back up the policies that you've already presented and really get at that why. Why is this going to help my learning? Um, then coming back together as a whole class. And if you teach a really small class, you might even skip this part, the small group discussion, asking each group to share one idea and creating a combined list. So getting each group to go around, maybe adding that to the front board or typing that in to um, share with the class. And then a class agreement. So whether it's on that same day or in the next class session, presenting a finalized list to students for their approval and checking for potential revisions or clarifications. So this is kind of an overall process and I'll go through a few examples. Yeah. Seems like what you're missing is let's say the whole class misses two or three things that you think are really important. Mm. Don't you want to be able to add them and insert them and get the full buy -in? That's a great point. Yeah, so for the online, what if they're missing something, right? Do we add something? Um, and I think that can, yeah, there can be a point where you as the teacher say, I'm part of this community. I'd also like to suggest X. Mm -hmm. Or maybe even when you're introducing the individual reflection, you show some examples and those examples are ones that you think are really important. So it kind of primes them to, okay, if these are the examples, here's what I'm gonna base my ideas off of. Um, yeah, <laughs> drop in on the small groups. Have you thought about, um, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, so some guiding questions, I have a bunch of these. Um, when you're a member of a class or group, what guidelines for interaction do you most value? Um, what values or principles should we prioritize as a class? Uh, what motivates you to participate in class? What do you need from your classmates for productive interactions? What can I do to help support your learning? What are the characteristics of the most positive classrooms you've been a part of? It's a number of ways to word this, uh, word these questions for students to reflect on. And you could give them a few and say, you know, whatever's coming to mind for you. Um, also lots of ways to facilitate this in terms of tools. So online, in-person, hybrid. I think Sahil and I have tried this in all different modalities. Um, you might use a shared document like a Google Doc. You might have students use pen and paper, um, polling tools like Poll Everywhere or Mentimeter, digital boards like Miro or Padlet, Zoom tools. Um, what I typically do is hand out post-it notes to students and say, during the individual reflection, write three ideas on post-it notes. Um, and then when you get in your groups, combine your post-it notes and try to sort them and with the sticky this, it's easier to sort them. And then I have them come and kind of stick them up on the front board and we create this poster together that often stays hanging in that classroom or um, can say kind of fold it up and we unravel it each time we come back into the class. Um, so that's why I think we kept the picture post-it notes there. So here's an, 
example of class norms, and I, I will preface this and say these are education students, so they often have um, really strong ideas on these types of things or have done these types of activities or have even learned about the value of doing this with their own students um, in K through 12 settings. So these were kind of, this is my summary of the ideas that they came up with, but they came up with these words and then these uh, descriptions are based on their different ways of defining those words. So um, our class norms, we agree to be respectful, open-minded, engaged, growth-oriented, and active listeners. And this was a slide I showed on the second day of class. So I said, you know, I, I took our discussion, I reread all your post-its, here's what we came up with, how do we feel about these? Um, and then these kind of stay on the Canvas site, we bring them up. Um, I also have them reflect on them midway through the semester. So I say, let's reread our class norms and um, you know, how are you doing in them? Pick one or two that you wanna focus on for the remainder of the semester. And they typically, at least I remember in this class, all of them picked engaged. They said, you know, I, I really haven't been super engaged. I'm gonna focus more on um, speaking up during discussion or I'm gonna put my cell phone away to be more engaged. So getting them to reflect on, are you upholding these principles that you said were important? Um, and what are you going to do differently for the remainder of the semester? These are super impressive. And like you said, in education plans, I'm just curious if other people think that their students could come up with a comparable list. In my class, we did sort of class rules because it was a strategy and stress management course. People were going to be sharing personal things. Mm -hmm. We had to discuss confidentiality stepping up, stepping back, like that kind of thing. And so I prodded them into, you know, how do we want to handle confidentiality? Do we want to mm. talk about it this way? Do we want to talk about it this way? And then they would go, how oh, about this? Okay, put it up on the board. So you might prod, yeah. they might come up with it. You might plan that they then comment on, like mm -hmm. there's different mm -hmm. ways to make sure that you get what you want on the list. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and I think the, the point being that this feels co-created or it is co-created and feels they're much more bought in. You can reference it and say, you decide, you made these decisions. We agreed that this is what's going to benefit you and your learning. Um, and you so, can adjust it later. You can go, yeah. oh, you know, on the first day of class, we didn't anticipate that there would be a terrorist attack on the Capitol. Now that there is, we want to add like, you know, da -da 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 to the list. I mean, this semester is an election. Yeah. So I think it's really important to have ways for people to share their views and not feel yep. intimidated. So I and totally buy in, person. but I think like, yeah, mm -hmm. discussing current events, I know it's been a big part of my class. Yeah. And the, to, I guess, back that up, this might be something you even decide to do on the second day of class or the third day of class as you're um, maybe in the first few classes, you model what you hope the classroom yeah. to you like, and then you decide now that we're going to get into deeper discussion or we're going to get into um, more difficult readings, we're going to develop some discussion norms or some class norms together because this might not be something they're ready for on the first day of class. So, a lot of this first day of class stuff is really more first few weeks of class can be. Um, I think we're, yeah, we go till 10 45, right? But we're just to that point, we, the session is started first day of class. Many of the things that we do actually set the tone for the whole semester, right? So the first day is a good way of setting what the course is going to look like overall. Um, so two things, two sort of underlying principles that we try to highlight through each of the activities that we've discussed, um, the active syllabus review, the community norm building, um, introducing course content and introductions is to build a sense of community in the classroom. I think each of these activities helps achieve that and also to center the student perspective overall. Um, so we, just to sort of summarize the different kinds of cate or categories of benefits um, that these two, that incorporating these two principles holds. One is it gives emotional benefits to your students. It, it sort of empowers them and motivates the students to be a part of the classroom. Um, it also creates a foundation for them to engage more fully in the learning process, um, centering these two principles. There are logistical benefits, uh, doing these activities, getting students to contribute and asking them to 
respond in a specific way, create structures of accountability that might be helpful for the overall course. And also it helps set clear expectations and guidelines as to what they should expect overall, that we are going to have a classroom that is uh, focused on community building and centering the student perspective. And finally, uh, there are social benefits as well, because uh, doing centering these two uh, principles helps foster a sense of social belonging in the classroom um, and in general establish a positive and inclusive classroom climate. Um, so we have we want to end this session off by giving you the opportunity to plan your first day. So we've discussed each of these four different activities, student introductions, active syllabus review, engaging with course content and collaborative norm setting. Um, we've developed a handout for the people in person. We have um, we have physical copies, but if you want to access the plan, you can either use the QR code or go to this um, URL. Um, the document is a Google Doc. It's view only, so you will not be able to edit it. So when you access it online, please either download it to your own computer as a Word document and work in that, or click on file and make a copy, um, which you can then use, save to your own drive and work on that. If you're on your phone, um, click three dots on the top right and say share and export. And from there, you can either save it as a Word document or save it to your own Google Drive by clicking make a copy. Um, so we'd like you to spend, we have five minutes left, uh, but yeah, so think about how you will do each of these in your first year of class. And also we've uh, asked you to think concretely about one step you will take on your first day to build community and to center the student perspective. Um, we have five minutes. Since we, yeah, since we don't have much time, maybe we can definitely still give you the yeah. handout. You might find it useful to use um, yeah. later on this week or later today. Um, but I think maybe taking advantage of the opportunity to talk mm -hmm. to yeah. each other okay. or yeah. Be, yeah, talking in pairs or small groups for a few minutes. Those of you who are online can do some reflection and then we'll come back together in just a few minutes. Yeah, I think that sounds good. Yeah, so if you want so physical you copies, I can <laughs> just come and distribute these. Interactive, I Folks, so let's just. I didn't like to that. So we're at time. Um, so let's just close, close out the session and sort of discuss some key takeaways. We'd like to end with this student partner quote on what they would feel as their ideal first day of class. Um, so they say on the ideal first day of class, the professor talks about the purpose of the class and students have a way to communicate privately with the instructor, an initial survey that sends a, mess sends a message that they care and get to know students. So I think we can end on this philosophy of care and that can be telegraphed through our activities that we do on the first day of class. Um, feel free to use the handout to develop your own first day that you're planning this semester. Uh, we have opportunities for discussing some of the topics we talked about further at, at upcoming sessions. So there's a session on student co-creation later today at 1.30. Um, there's a session on addressing challenging comments in the classroom at three. Um, feel free to request a consultation with one of our teaching and learning specialists and explore additional resources that we have on the CTRL website. Um, Hannah and my e email addresses are there. So feel free to write to us if you want to continue this conversation. The slides also have resources that we drew on to develop the presentation and other guidance for how to go about the first day of class. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. We hope this session was helpful for you. And we wish you luck in your first year class next or in, in, in the next couple of weeks. Thank you. And for those of you who are in person, um, we'll follow up with an email of the slides and also a link to the yeah. feedback survey. And for those of you who are online, we really appreciate you filling out the feedback survey. Um, so we keep that in mind for future programming.